I, I come from, as you are aware, uh, a very, very strong background in terms of uh, social constructivism, that is that the students actually need to uh, access their experiences, their past experiences, and then building on those experiences so that uh, through the con conversations that they have, so that's the social part, um, they are actually constructing their own understandings. They are creating meaning, if you want to look at it that way. And and so uh, what, what they're really doing is um, the way that I explain it anyways to, to my students is that they are reorganizing the way that they actually have constructs in their brain, the, the concepts that they have floating around in their brain, uh, they're reorganizing, rewiring the way that those are placed in conjunction with each other, the connections that are being made, etc. So uh, what we're actually trying to do in the online kind of space is to provide opportunities for them to actually rewire. Now, the opportunities actually come as a consequence of the challenges that are placed in front of them, not as a consequence, at least from my perspective, not as a consequence of additional information that they have accessed. Um, so what we're really trying to do then is to provide them um, access to the, the way that I conceive of this is a, a uh, virtual sandbox. And, and you think about it from the perspective of the sandbox that children are going to play in rather than a sandbox that computer programmers are going to create uh, a new application. Um, so a, a child's sandbox has uh, limitations to it. It's got edges around it. And those edges could be made from concrete. They could be made from wood. They could be made from um, from plastic, there's a number of different kinds of pieces, or it could be just a, a hole that is dug into the ground, and so you have grass around the outside. It's still a barrier, it's still a boundary between what is in the sandbox and what is outside the sandbox. The interesting thing to note is that the sandbox metaphor actually works quite well in the sense that uh, most of the time you'll find the sand to be inside the sandbox, but there are times when children will actually go outside of the sandbox and they will take the sand with them and their toys and all those kinds of things. And that creates different kinds of environments with different kinds of limitations and different kinds of opportunities. Um, any, anyways, the sandbox that they're actually working in is going to also have certain kinds of sand in it. So certain kinds of media that you can work with and uh, depending upon the size of the grains of the sand, you can create different kinds of things. If you've got very, very large grains of sand, uh, it's very, very difficult to actually create anything of fine structure because uh, it'll just fall apart. There's nothing to bind it together. Uh, and even if you have a fair amount of water, uh, the water just drains right through uh, large particles of sand and doesn't leave you with much. Um, if you've got finer grains of sand, then you can actually create sand castles and all kinds of sculptures and all those kinds of things, depending upon what your creativity uh, allows you to actually um, uh, make use of and, and how you go about creating those kinds of pieces. Um, you also have a number of tools. Uh, normally, we would call, call them, um, you know, things like uh, uh, shovels and pails and, uh, you know, th those kinds of pieces. And in ed ed educational technology kinds of contexts, we call those things apps um, and the variety of different kinds of apps. Um, but again, each one of those uh, toys or tools that we have in, in the sandbox, they have different kinds of constraints, or we call them affordances, uh, that allow you to do certain kinds of things with them. So you can take a shovel and you can move sand from one place to another with a fair amount of granularity as compared to a pail. A pail also allows you to move sand from one place to another, but it's not a particularly great uh, tool for doing those kinds of things. So if you move that, that metaphor or the analogy over into the ed tech kind of world, yeah, you can put, to, put, put a table together in a word processor. You can get it to do calculations, but why would you do that? Because you're spending so much more time and effort actually getting the, the, the tool to actually do those kinds of toys, uh, do those kinds of tasks. Move over to a, um, a, a piece of software or an application that actually has that kind of capability built into it. 
like a spreadsheet and it becomes much simpler. Now, it also means that you need to know how to work with it. So you need some competencies or some skills to be able to work with those kinds of pieces. Um, in the sandbox also, to go back to the analogy or the metaphor, um, we also have people. And people can also uh, provide you with access to different kinds of ideas. So the diversity, um, the inclusivity comes part to be part of this. And the equity kinds of pieces, or we can have discussions about those. We should have discussions because you want to actually have uh, value placed on the kinds of interactions that you can have. And you want to value the people who are in the sandbox with you as well. But you should also expect them to provide you with lots of feedback that you can actually use to uh, modify the kind of work that you're actually doing or the kinds of sand uh, castles that you're building. Um, so the, the critical feedback is the stuff that you can actually make use of because it allows you to modify and create better uh, structures um, and, and understand how to do those kinds of pieces. So what I'm talking about then is that there are at least two different components that, that you want to have inside your sandbox. Um, you, you want to talk about what, what kinds of products can we actually create, what kind of sandcastles can we create. But we also need to talk about the processes that are actually involved. Um, we need to talk about how do we actually create those kinds of pieces. And we need skills in both of those areas. And so when, when I talk about moving into the online space, I'm talking about developing skills and competencies in both of those areas simultaneously. And you do that by upping the challenge. You, you increase the challenge of the tasks that are in front of you but you also uh, need to develop, continue to develop the skills to be able to match those, those uh, kinds of um, task challenges that you have. And uh, uh, of course, I'm talking there about moving into flow um, so that you actually uh, end up with a match between the skill that you have and the challenge that's in front of you. So those kinds of things are much easier in the virtual environment, I'm convinced of it anyways, because we've got access to all the tools, the, the shovels and the, uh, the pails, and uh, we can make use of them because they're right in front of us. They're part of the, uh, the repertoire of tools or the, the, the toolbox that we have available at, at our fingertips. Um, and, and I'm particularly uh, taken with this whole idea of open education from the perspective that uh, open education is not about just resources, i.e. textbooks, free textbooks, and all that kind of stuff. It's also about open pedagogy. So the kinds of tasks that we have in front of us, um, making sure that they are uh, tasks that are, are uh, accessible beyond just the formal learning kind of period um, so that uh, you, you can continue to access those, those particular tasks. And I'm thinking about things like... Um, uh, I've, I've got my graduate students putting together shared libraries within Zotero. Um, uh, I know some of the other profs in, in the faculty here, they create um, large scale wikis that have been running for a number of years and the students continue to add to the information that's in there. Uh, so it becomes essentially an encyclopedia, but it's a student built encyclopedia. And uh, it, it's the same task that's being given year after year, term after term to the students, but uh, there, there's long-term value in that kind of work rather than the short term. You know, I, I'm gonna spend three hours on making this particular product, and then the prop is going to actually look at it for half an hour, maybe, um, and then we'll never ever look at it again. Nobody will look at it again. Um, the other piece of openness that I actually want, wanted to get to is this whole idea of open tools open source kinds of tools. Um, so I'm talking about outside of the LMSs and the formal kinds of structures that most universities uh, set up um, because uh, students have this um, propensity to think that, well, I can't have too many places that I can go. Well, I, personally, I think that if, if you want to actually make use of tools, go out and get the best tools. And those usually are the ones that are being produced on almost a daily basis 
that do a number of different kinds of things. They all have different kinds of affordances and get in there and start using them, uh, et cetera. So all of that it contributes to this whole business of the, the, the way that online is different from a, a uh, physically co-located, uh, I use that kind of terminology rather than face-to-face. -face. Anyways, you got me started. Uh, you got me on the soapbox. Uh, yeah. So what's the next question? <laughs> so if I want to go back to your sandbox and uh, one of the things that, and, and this is why I, I really want to hear you about this, um, new faculty, faculty members who've been teaching all their lives, uh, face, like the physical uh, in their classrooms, not the, the virtual ones. Um, they're moving now online and they're listening to you talking about the sandbox and talking about all the different, you know, activities and all the different tools, etc. How do you do it? You've been teaching online for a while, concretely, practically, like this is how I do it. How yeah, do you do yeah. it? Yeah, so uh, one of the first things I think that, that you need to recognize is, and, and this is something that, that I came to, to grips with very early on in my academic career. So 2004, 2005, I ran a, uh, a, a large scale um, research project where I was giving uh, tablet PCs. So this is relatively new in the whole idea of uh, tablets, right? So they they looked like they were laptops, but they actually came with a, a, a pen and you could write on the screen. Um, so it, it, it was a new kind of conception. They were fairly expensive, um, about $2,500 a piece, and I was getting them at cost. Uh, I gave them to 30 students in the Faculty of Science and, and then um, followed them for the next year. Um, that uh, particular study was really kind of interesting because it opened my eyes to this whole idea. Well, if you just give them the tools, then they'll change the world. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, the, the, the problem is that, and I'll give you the findings and then my, my interpretation. Um, but I, I was following these students um, and, and they were working in the Faculty of Science and I'm coming from education. So we... we figured out how to talk to each other eventually. But um, the, the interesting piece was that I kept hearing from the students over and over again in the focus groups that I was uh, having, how the tablet PC, they loved it uh, and, and they wanted to make sure that they had access to it for the next number of years, et cetera, uh, which of course I couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, accede to their, their uh, requests. Um, but what were they doing with it? they were essentially taking better notes is what they were talking about. So, you know, here I was giving them a $2,500 piece of equipment uh, to do something that they can do just as well with a pen and a piece of paper. Um, it, it, I started to wonder, you know, so what's happening here? My interpretation is that it's not about the tools. It's about the orientation of your mind to begin with. If you start looking for innovative ways of uh, dealing with educational kinds of contexts, et cetera, you are probably going to experience much more transformation than if you're looking to, to use the tools. Because what, what happens with the tools, and, and I'll give you another example of how this actually worked in this past year. Um, so we were looking at um, moving from, or, or renewing um, a, a contract that we had for our learning management system at, at the university. Um, the, uh, the, the way that we went about this is asking all of the faculty through a series of uh, surveys and other kinds of processes um, what they actually wanted to have within an LMS. What it came down to is that uh, we created a, uh, a request for proposals from uh, companies that uh, produced uh, LMSs or had the products um, of, I think it was 350 or 360 affordances or features that needed to be in there. What was really going on, or my interpretation of, of what was going on is that professors wanted to be able to do what they were already doing, but having the ability to do it within the LMS. So in other words, what was happening is that the LMS was not transforming, but allowing them to continue doing exactly what they were doing to begin with. So again, again, it's that, that conception that you have to change your mindset, first of all. All right, having established that, I hope, uh, the, the whole idea is that uh, I, I went into the whole um, business of going online 
uh, with the assistance of yourself and a number of other individuals in, uh, uh, at Ontario Tech U, um, with the idea that uh, maybe there is a different way of approaching education uh, rather than laying out content. I had done that for 18 years within in the K-12 system, public and private schools across the country, and came to the conclusion that, no, tech, uh, the, the, uh, the content orientation doesn't get you anywhere. For one thing, it, it limits you to the bottom levels, if I can think of it that way, of Bloom's taxonomy, so the memorization, maybe a little bit of the analysis, maybe a little bit of the application, but primarily it's at the memorization kind of level. I wanted to access the entire taxonomy. How do you get to the analysis, to the synthesis, to the evaluation? How do you get to the creativity, all of those pieces, which are all part of learning as well? Uh, but we normally don't deal with those, uh, and, and it's really kind of interesting. I remember back to uh, an ASR video um, by Ken Robinson, uh, where he talks about uh, what happens to, uh, to students uh, as they go through the educational process, and uh, to hear him talk about it, he's talking about the decrease in creativity that actually occurs as a consequence of, of uh, being becoming educated. So it's this whole idea of uh, coloring between the lines kind of idea. All right, so having established all of that kind of stuff, what is the alternative? The alternative uh, comes out of a, um, a school that's not too far from here. So I've moved from Oshawa and I'm now in Hamilton. Um, so uh, a couple of kilometers to my uh, west is uh, McMaster University. And during the 1960s and 1970s, McMaster was going through a transformation of itself for the medical program and then subsequently in the engineering programs as well. Um, what they actually started to do is explore this whole idea of problem-based learning. So problem-based learning has at its core that it's experiential. You learn by doing rather than priming the pump and then seeing what it is that you've memorized uh, by giving you exams or something along those lines. So uh, the, maybe I should actually back up just a little bit too. The reason why they actually went to problem-based learning is this whole idea that diagnostic skills for medical practitioners is a very, very good uh, skill set to actually have when you have everybody and anybody coming to you as a family practitioner and you need to be able to figure out what it is that they are experiencing and then how to go about uh, treating it. Um, so that becomes the basis for the um, identification of what the problem is, so the, the cause of the actual uh, number of symptoms that they're experiencing, that the patients are experiencing, and then coming up with a solution, i.e. a cure or a treatment. Um, so those two pieces uh, identify the problem or create the problem, is the terminology that I use now. Um, and then coming up with a solution or a set of solutions, because there might be a number of things that you actually want to try. Um, is, is there a definitive uh, answer? Uh, no, um, because the world is unfortunately uh, a really complex place. Um, and it has a number of different kinds of uh, characteristics that present themselves or not present themselves. We're seeing that with COVID as well, right? So is COVID really a virus that is primarily respiratory? Uh, the evidence is mounting that it is not. That's how it presents itself to begin with in a lot of people. But now we're starting to see that there's all kinds of issues with blood clotting in the kidneys, uh, in the vascular tissues, um, it, it, in the lungs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyhow, I'm not going to go too far down that road. Uh, I'm a biologist by background, so you can probably tell that a little bit. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about problem-based learning then is, so what do you do? So let, let's get to the pragmatics. Um, I, I take a look at uh, the, as a formal definition for what problem-based learning should be, um, from Robin Fogarty in 1997, she's got a book, uh, about uh, problem-based learning and the characteristics of it, et cetera. Um, I, I haven't got the, uh, the references right now, but I can get those for you if you want. Um, anyways, in that, that, uh, the definition for problem-based learning, she talks about 
problem-based learning being real world based. In other words, it needs to have the kind of complexity that we find within the real world. Um, our human mind has this tendency to actually sort and, and classify things and um, only pay attention to things that we think are important, but the real world has all of this, this complexity, this detail that we need to actually have available to us when we're doing problem-based learning, uh, because that's part of um, the, the situation that we're actually in. Um, she also talks about that uh, the real world um, has no structure to it, no necessary structure to it, in the sense that it, you can actually pay attention to various parts. So for instance, in this room, you may be actually interested in the movement that's actually occurring with the fan, um, as compared to you know, the electronics that are, are uh, displayed in terms of the musical instruments. Um, those are part of the ill-structuredness. I mean, what does the fan have to do with the, the instruments? not much other than they're in the same room with me, right? Um, and, and then uh, I won't show you the rest of the room because it's filled with more electronics. So you start to see electronics, uh, anyways. Um, the, uh, the, the ill structuredness is really kind of important because it gives you opportunity, gives the learner opportunity to pay attention to certain kinds of things to the exclusion of other kinds of things. So in other words, they get to make choices that are of import to them, which is motivational in nature, and it leads to engagement, and engagement hopefully learns to, uh, uh, leads to better learning as you're going along. So it's that kind of piece. Uh, opportunities for choice, uh, leading to motivation, leading to engagement, leading to learning. Um, the, the other piece that uh, Fogarty talks about is that um, the world is ambiguous. We don't know exactly what's going on until we start looking at it. And even then, so this is in the, the, uh, the, the place where I actually need to pull in radical constructivism too. So radical constructivism for me leads to this whole idea that knowing, if I know something, it's in my mind. And it's not in somebody else's mind because they've got different experiences and different ways of looking at the same events. Uh, if you asked five uh, witnesses uh, of a car accident what they saw, chances are you'll get five different stories. And why is that? Well, because they're all looking at different details, right? Um, so it, this uh, knowing is in the mind of the knower is, is a, a really interesting uh, part of this uh, amb ambiguity that we actually have within the, the, the real world environment. The final piece that uh, Fogarty talks about is open-endedness. Um, it, it needs to have a number of possibilities that you can actually address. So once you've come up with a problem, what are you going to do about that particular problem? Well, you need to investigate the problem as much as possible, leading to a number of possible solutions. And which one of them is correct? Well, maybe they're all correct. Uh, it depends on who's actually uh, investigating and who's coming up with those particular questions, etc. cetera. Uh, notice how strikingly different what I've been talking about is from traditional education, where uh, a problem is given, and this is coming from my background in mathematics in, in high school, a problem is given, and where's the answer? It's in the back of the textbook. And so if you really want to figure out uh, how to address that problem, maybe you can reverse engineer it from the, the, uh, the, the answer in the back of the book. Um, in problem-based learning, we don't know what the problems are to begin with, because those are decisions that are made by the, uh, the learners. We don't know what the solutions are. Um, so there's all kinds of ambiguity, all kinds of opportunity in, in all of that. So what do I do specifically, the practicality, now that I've laid all that groundwork? Uh, before yeah, we go ahead. Practically, practically. Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> so before we go um, to uh, this very specifically, uh, a first question that will come up from any faculty who is listening to you is, okay, but if I have very specific learning objectives, how can yeah. I reach if everything is ambiguous and, and we don't control anything? So now <laughs> give us a concrete example. Yeah, well, this depends on, on how you see the world, right? Uh, I do not see the world as, as being a set of questions and answers that have very specific answers. Um, in fact, uh, I, I react 
quite negatively to this concept of things being right and being wrong. Um, there are uh, there are always contexts within which we actually need to to take a look at. Um, if you think back to the uh, uh, the television um, show called House, where there was this, and it's contrived and all that kind. Of, yeah, that I get it. Um, and in fact, I, I reacted to that way to it as well. But if you take a look at what's going on in each episode, what he's really doing is reacting to the context within which the or the the uh, the patient is uh, having issues or or whatever it is that that was causing the, the the problem. So I would suggest that the context is very very important. Um, and, and I'm getting to the point of uh, saying that content is not the be-all and end-all. What we're really trying to do with problem-based learning is to actually go deep diving into a particular set of constructs, ways that we see the world, as compared to briefly skimming a whole bunch of things. So it's a very, very good opportunity to have uh, set up very, very good, sound uh, understandings of a very small amount of information. But that actually is in accord with a lot of what we have going on within our society. Our society actually respects, or it has in the past, and I'm starting to wonder about it <laughs> due to the political situation that we have, primarily south of the border, um, uh, this whole idea of respect for expertise. And so problem-based learning is moving in that kind of direction. It's developing expertise of the individuals who are involved in it. And, and rightly so. I mean, if you're going to have good medical practitioners and good engineers who can actually assess the situation, the context within which the, uh, the, the issue that needs to be addressed is, is uh, developing, uh, they need to be able to actually have that diagnostic kind of ability, et cetera. Um, so I, I know that I haven't specifically answered your question. But. No. <laughs> so again, like if you have, because for every course you would have very specific learning objectives, right? And you, you have to reach these learning objectives. You have to make sure that your students by the end of the course will be able to do X, Y, and Z or develop these competencies or, right? So you have to make sure that this is why, the, and the students need to have this reinsurance in a way that this is, this is why I'm taking this course. Yeah, but my, I, I would suggest that that assurance or insurance or, which, or insurance, I'm not sure which terminology is correct here, is illusory. You know, so the traditional way of looking at uh, a, a set of content would be to make sure that you break it down into sizable chunks, make sure that you do a very, very good, clear uh, presentation of that information, um, allow for uh, opportunities to, uh, for, for students to actively engage with it, whatever that means. Um, I'm not sure what active engagement or active learning is all about. Uh, it seems like it's a move towards con social constructivism, but you aren't required to actually talk with that anyways. Um, because the, that, this is one of the challenges that every time I talk about problem-based learning and I, I, I explain that I use it maybe at, maybe at not, not at a hundred percent degree. Like sometimes I, you know, I, I mix other, um, approaches or models, but the, this is the first question that they ask me. Okay. But how do you make sure that your students are actually learning through this experience, what you want them to learn? Because this is like, these are the courses and they're here in the program to make sure that the students will develop these very specific skills or competencies. So that, that, this is exactly what, yeah, this is why yeah. I'm asking, I'm yeah. referring back to you the question, because even when I explain the experience and I explain what you create and how they develop and the, the, the control that they have on their own learning experience and how this will actually engage them and really motivate them to as you said, dig deeper and go further than whatever we can just, you know, give them if we have content and we're taking their hands in, and, you know, by taking them by hand and we're working them through the experience. Um, I'm still trying to like, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Business. So this is why well, I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to back me up with this, you know? Yeah. So remember back to the beginning of this conversation where I talked about, you know, it's not the tools, it's yeah. the mindset. 
So that's really where I'm going with this. Um, the, the, uh, I'm going to follow up with this the whole idea of uh, how content um, uh, learning or memorization is illusory. So once you get, and there's been a number of studies, once you get to the exam or the test or whatever, uh, you can actually have uh, a, um, a determination as to how much was memorized or if you want to use that terminology, learned uh, after the exam. But here's the question. If you ask those same students, uh, even the ones who did very, very well on the test or the exam two days later, uh, what do they remember of that particular content? And the more time you have, the less the response is going to be. Um, it, there's a, a very striking drop off. So in other words, what's happened is that you load up the short term memory banks and hopefully you get some of that moving into the long term memory banks. Um, but there's no assurance of that at, at a, a pace of 12 weeks or 13 weeks within a term. There, there's just no way that you can actually do that. And you see the, the, the kind of uh, responses on the parts of the students when they're going through these very heavy content oriented terms of courses, they actually cram the night before the exam or, you know, th those kinds of, of uh, processes. And, and there is no assurance, even with the exam. So the exam is giving you the illusion that they are, are learning something and has made a change in their lives. What I'm saying, actually, if you change the orientation for the processes that they're actually working on, they are actually going to have a transformative experience in the sense that the learning that we're talking about within problem-based learning, it's not memorization. It's actually talking about reorganizing the way that they're thinking. So the metacognitive and reflective kinds of pieces become extremely important. Uh, I, and what I mean by metacognition and reflection um, is this whole idea of being able to think about the thinking processes that you're engaged in. So going back to the procedural and, and product or declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge, we're actually ingraining this whole idea of procedures. The processes that you've learned to, lo you, to learn something during problem-based learning become part of you because they are actually restructured in your brain. And then the next time you actually need to actually access those same kinds of diagnostic skills or those same kinds of skills and competences, et cetera, you may not remember what the outcomes were, but you have the processes because they're part of your memory. They're part of you. Um, and you can actually reconstruct those very, very simply. And therefore, it will actually help you in the future rather than uh, having to look it up again. Uh, and this is the, the other piece with content. Um, in, in the online space, we have access to more information and better information than human beings have ever had before. And it's not just in the form of a single textbook or in the form of uh, declarative knowledge from a specific uh, authoritary, uh, authoritative individual. We actually have access to much of the acquired information from the entire history of humanity. And as a consequence, I think what we need to do is start focus on how do we make sense out of all of that information rather than memorizing that information. And, and again, that's that transformative piece, moving your mind from education is not about acquiring information. It's about how do we make use of that information, i.e. how do we understand it? How do we make sense out of it? And how do we actually go about creating better problems? Uh, or better questions uh, rather than focusing in on the answers. Yeah. I spent four months, I think, memorizing the, the booklet for the, um, the, the Canadian uh, immigration test. Yep, yep. I did the test. And, uh, you know, I'm not asking you to, uh, to ask me the second day. It was really after five minutes. Everything was erased. I passed the test, 20 over 20. <laughs> but everything was erased after that. Yeah, this is crazy. Okay, so going back to what you were saying, uh, some argue that um, 
Yeah, hundred percent. Like the whole process has to be, you know, like uh, the whole experience and really making sure because through uh, going through this process of thinking about, you know, um, the, uh, the the information and the, how you're using it is super important. But you have to have some basic knowledge so you can. And many argue, and I've been hearing this a lot, right? That regardless of your field, you have to have this basic knowledge from where you will start. Like without knowing that you won't be able to function within a certain discipline. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is the, the, the uh, perennial, I, I call it priming the pump. Uh, you, you actually have to have water in the pump before you can get it to, to pump water, right? Because uh, you're, you're creating this vacuum um, throughout the column. Um, um, I, I go back to uh, watching my grandchildren. Um, so my grandchildren, when uh, they are born, they are essentially sponges um, that are problem-based learning sponges. Um, when they're learning to walk, for instance, uh, they actually are looking around, uh, taking a look at, at you know, the, the adults that are around who are walking or if there's an older sibling, et cetera. They will try to emulate it, but when it really comes down to it, to walk, you actually have to figure it out yourself. Um, and what are the best learning opportunities? Well, it's not when you, not just when you can actually find yourself uh, hanging on to the coffee table or, or the couch and you're finding yourself uh, on your own two legs. Uh, I would suggest that it's more important to actually um, have those opportunities, and this is gonna sound cruel, uh, to end up uh, doing face plants or uh, ending up on your rear end and uh, intuitively figuring out, hmm, that kind of hurts. I don't want to do that again. So what can I do to change the experience, change the way that I was actually addressing this particular issue so that I end up with more success? So what I, again, I, I'm going back to this whole idea of challenge. Uh, the challenge being that the whole idea of, of uh, creating uh, circumstances where we actually need to make modifications to our behavior, to our thinking, that'll lead us to different kinds of innovative kinds of pieces. Um, if if one-year-olds, because most of us learn how to walk uh, through this process of problem-based learning, where is the priming of the pump? I don't know. And, and what are the basics that these people are talking about? What are these basics? And, and you'll, you'll talk to five, 10 individuals and they will give you different answers again. So are there basics? I'm much more a proponent of if you come up with a problem and you can set up the sandboxes in such a way that they actually provide opportunities to learn these kinds of pieces. And then the students say, I don't know how to do this. Or how do you address these kinds of pieces? That gives you the learning opportunity or the, uh, the just-in-time learning uh, kind of piece where you can actually develop the skills. And you can do that uh, using direct learning as well. Um, so in other words, you can direct instruction for these small little pieces so that they can use that particular technique to address the larger questions. The, the, the interesting piece about problem-based learning too is that they aren't set within dom specific domains. Uh, as I said, going back to the real world kind of piece, they are actually cross-curricular or cross-domain kinds of pieces so that you actually have to pick and choose from a whole bunch of domains to actually be able to address the problems to come up with the kinds of solutions. And it, it gives you the prime opportunities to move into those kinds of places where you can do the direct instruction for small little pieces um, and, and this is the way I deal with graduate students as well. Um, they, they set what their problems are uh, when they set out their, their thesis proposals. And then we work through the kinds of issues that they actually need to address. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at uh, uh, the development of um, non-parametric statistical analysis because of the way that we've set up uh, the digital competency profiler um, and, and all those kinds of pieces. Well, you're not going to get a course uh, about those kinds of pieces. Why not learn it while you need to and use it and it'll become part of you again. 
so we're looking at for the long-term kinds of pieces rather than the short term. Um, that's the way that I address that particular issue. Mm -hmm. So going back, because I, uh, I interrupted you when you were, you were going to talk about your courses and how you do things. So <laughs> let's go back to this and sure. concretely yeah. and practically, what do you do? Yeah, so um, essentially, if you, if you take a look at my graduate courses in particular, um, what I do is a series of modules. And the, the modules are usually about three weeks in length or so. Um, and uh, they, can, they, they follow the same kind of pattern as you're going along. Um, by the way, much of uh, what I'm actually going to be describing is something that was uh, put together by a colleague of mine, and I worked on, on this project with him. Um, I was the subject and he was the, uh, the researcher, uh, John Lawrence Benz, uh, 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 Larry Benz from uh, the Ontario Institute of Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. Um, and you can actually see his material still on, uh, on his website. Uh, I can give you the URL if you're, you're looking for it. Um, it's these sequential kinds of processes that we go through. Uh, so to, just to describe very briefly what he is talking about, and then I'll bring it back to what I do within my modules as well. Um, so he's got essentially a, a, a set of three kinds of processes that he goes through. First one is elicitation of um, the understandings or prior conceptions of the individual. In other words, what do they already know about the particular topic or theme? Um, so you draw that out, you ask questions, and you, you, as the instructor, you need to listen to what it is that they're saying, um, which is a really kind of an interesting piece. So you've got the instructor, by the way, it's not instruction anymore, because there's very little instruction. I'm asking questions, so it's more Socratic than anything, um, going back to 4,000 years ago. Um, the, the whole idea of listening and being an active listener uh, so you can actually ask probing questions about their particular pieces. And there's a number of ways of, of being able to actually elicit that. Um, it needs to be recorded on an individual basis as well. So that becomes a starting point or a baseline of the individual's understanding of that particular topic that they can come back to uh, afterwards. Um, then the next thing that you do is, so once you've got them looking at a particular shiny object, so this is their prior conception or their, their way of uh, understanding the particular topic, what you do as an instructor or as a facilitator is bring in another shiny object that looks sort of like, but is different from the original. So now you've got two pieces in front of you, two concepts if you want, that are contrasting. And it has to be contrasting from the perspective that you want to create uh, confusion or cognitive dissonance is the terminology um, in the mind of the individual who uh, uh, is the learner at that point. Um, you are acting, to, to go to Vygotskyan terminology, you are acting as a more knowledgeable other by asking questions or um, intervening by putting this, this second uh, shiny object in front of them. The issue then becomes, now you've got this confusion, you've got this, this set of questions in your mind. How do you figure out what is the best shiny object for you? And what are the contexts or the situations around the, the, uh, the um, benefits of one of these conceptions to the other? There's at least three different ways that you can actually look at this, this uh, uh, contrast. You can accept the original, and throw away the, the, uh, the second, or converse, you can actually accept the, the sec second one and throw away your prior conception, at which point you're really not doing a great job of trying to figure things out, because all you're doing is saying, I'm gonna take the easy road, um, and, and try to figure out what's actually happening. The better way, the third way, is by perhaps uh, assimilating the information with your existing structures so that you come up with a hybrid of understandings as you're going through. The, the last stage of this process is again asking the learner, what do you understand now about the, the uh, particular concept, et cetera. So it's this continuous rotation through this asking about the prior conceptions, giving an alternative view um, and, and creating the cognitive dissonance, allowing the individual, the learner, to, uh, to figure out what it is that they know now, and then asking them to, to um, uh, 
describe that or to to give it back to you in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and I always always get them to make a comparison between what do they know at the end of the process as compared to what they knew at the beginning of the process. Reflect on that because that again becomes the differential between what they have learned really uh, as going on. All right. So how do you put that into a module within higher education? Um, the way that I start this is that I actually give a series of uh, what I'm, I'm calling problem-based learning objects, and they've got a very, very strict um, uh, kind of orientation to them, structure uh, to the way that they're actually put together. But the basis of the entire uh, problem-based learning object is this whole idea of a video-based case study. And the video-based case study is essentially a one and a half to two minute kind of very, very short video clip that describes a situation. That's it. So it's a picture of a, an event or an incident, something along those lines. Uh, to give you an example, um, uh, uh, we have a uh, fairly large highway that comes out of Toronto, moving to the east towards Montreal, and it actually moves from Toronto to Oshawa, which is on the way uh, on the north shore of, of Lake Ontario. And as it moves from, uh, from Toronto into the outlying cities, it comes across a section, so I'm talking about the 401 as it travels north of uh, Lake Ontario, co comes across a section where there's a confluence of a large number of train tracks. Uh, those train tracks are used by daily commuters, so the GO trains use those train tracks. Uh, those train tracks are also used by, or at least they used to be, by Via Rail uh, as it was moving towards Cornwall, to, uh, to Ottawa, to Montreal, um, and, and the rest of the country from there. Um, it's also used, it's, it's one of the major uh, routes for most of the, um, the freight that is actually traveling around the, the country as well. So anything that's going through uh, to the eastern provinces um, is going to go through those, those particular uh, tracks. So it's really, really busy. And you'll actually see a um, fair number of uh, tracks that cross over the 401, et cetera. On this particular day that, that you're driving out of the 401, you come across a derailment um, of a, a train, a freight train. And this freight train actually happened to have a number of um, uh, liquid um, container cars and some of those liquid container cars you notice that that the back of them had these triangular you know caution kinds of signs that there were some caustic materials on them etc and some of these uh, these containers were leaking uh, it wasn't oil by the way something something else um, and uh, uh, the, the the question becomes so how do you see the situation and what are you going to do about it? Well, I would contend that to a large extent, it depends on who you are and what you see as your role. Um, so in this particular instance, I'm going to suggest that you, being the, the, uh, the car driver, are actually the mayor of the locality in which the uh, derailment has occurred. So you're a politician. Um, and as a politician, immediately I would think that one of the first things that you would want to do is uh, get your first responders uh, to the location so that they can start dealing with the situation. So that becomes an issue of communication. Uh, how do you deal with communication uh, about the, the situation? How do you get the people who know what they're doing uh, into, uh, in, into place, et cetera? You may actually need to move from there into another set of decisions about uh, are, are you going to have to move the population out of the area? Um, are, are you going to have to uh, uh, ensure their safety by making sure that they're not going to be exposed, etc.? cetera? Um, later on, you actually might start thinking as the mayor that uh, um, how do we deal with cleanup and who's responsible and what about liability and who's going to pay for this? And if you're a real cynical politician, we don't have any of those, thankfully, in Canada, uh, you might even think about how do I make use of this particular situation for re-election purposes uh, somewhere down the line. Uh, all of these things would be uh, considered to be 
problems or you can problematize the situation in certain kinds of ways. So you're essentially creating the problem that you're going to be addressing uh, as you're going through. Um, would that be the same if you were an EMS worker? Uh, so if you were driving out of Toronto towards uh, Oshawa, you come across this train derailment and you happen to be an off-duty uh, off paramedic. How are you going to see the situation? Well, you're not going to think about liability necessarily because it's not your concern. You're not going to think necessarily about cleanup. You're not going to think about um, uh, do we need to get the, uh, the population out of the area? Uh, all of those kinds of things. No, as a paramedic, you're probably much more concerned. Is there anybody hurt and can I help them? Uh, what can I do to actually get to them? Uh, what kind of obstacles do I have to overcome to actually get to their to addressing their physical safety, and can I get them to uh, to the proper treatment and all that kind of stuff? Um, or if you're an ecologist, uh, you're again going to same, see the same situation in a very different kind of way. Um, uh, what I'm trying to do with this illustration is to to suggest that by presenting a context or a situation, what you're actually doing is accessing the past experiences of the individual so that they can actually start to identify what are the problems that they want to concentrate on. You get them to create the problems and then it becomes your uh, consideration as a facilitator to actually contrast their view of what they're seeing with something that is different, setting up the cognitive dissonance and then giving them the opportunities to go and explore. So go and find out about this particular piece. Come back and tell us what you found out, not only in terms of the product itself, the information that you're dealing with, but how did you go about uh, de deriving that information? How did you create your understanding, your meaning? Um, and, and I usually get students to do this in groups of three or four uh, because there's uh, an advantage that you have if you've got three or four different kinds of experiential backgrounds to be brought to the issues in front of you. It gives you the opportunity to, to put on different sets of glasses if you want, to see it from different kinds of perspectives. Um, so we go through a series of these kinds of modules in our graduate studies and the students tell us what they found out. Now, the interesting piece is that I would also suggest that this has, gives you the opportunity to change assessment practices. Because what is going to be the point of putting together an exam that has only a certain set of questions on it? Well, those questions may never have been addressed by the students in the first place. So exams out the window. Um, and in fact, I'm not much of a, a, um, a fan of an exam. Um, my understanding from taking lots and lots of assessment courses, et cetera, is that an exam tells you uh, the people who are good at taking that exam uh, and nothing more or not much more, a uh, little bit more perhaps, but uh, you, you need to actually do a lot more assessment to be able to figure those kinds of pieces out. So what are we doing in terms of formal uh, assessment? The, the formal parts actually have more to do with the students uh, being able to actually go through these assessment processes themselves, doing self-assessment, because again, what we want to have happen here is that students don't need to look for an outside assessor telling them whether they've good, done a good job or not. They actually need to actually put that assessment practices or those assessment practices into their own skin. So they will intrinsically uh, develop not only the expertise, but they'll also be able to actually tell when a job is done well in other words, have they investigated enough so that they have a good understanding of what the problem is and the context, et cetera, so that they can come up with reasonable answers, uh, solutions that will fit the, the particular problem. And uh, the other piece that uh, is very important with this is that you, you can get very um, uh, uh, local in terms of the kinds of responses that is not necessarily the best thing because you can get very esoteric with your responses uh, if you're only looking at the locality as being the, the, uh, um, the, the context that you have to apply to. So I always get my students to move to the literature 
What does the literature, the, the, uh, the professional literature say about this particular uh, aspect? And only when their opinion matches up with what's actually in the literature can they say, yes, this is a valid kind of solution. Um, so there's always a check going to the larger community uh, as you're moving through these kinds of problems and scenarios. Um, we also want the students to actually interact with each other uh, as much as possible so that it's not the, um, the instructor, the facilitator, who becomes the main uh, police person, if you want. Um, maybe I've got to change that terminology these days. Uh, but anyways, uh, so uh, everybody within the community becomes, uh, uh, has, takes on the responsibility to uh, listen to what the uh, others are saying about their problem and their kinds of solutions and to provide critical feedback to the, uh, the learners. So we end up with this interaction between uh, community members where we are all taking on the role of providing critical feedback or assessing if you want. Um, so it becomes formative assessment, formative assessment over formative assessment over formative. Uh, where's the summative? Well, I would suggest um, summative really isn't the way that we live our lives. So why would we expect that suddenly uh, learning stops? In fact, we want learning to continue on. It needs to be lifelong. And that's another aim of problem-based learning as well. One of, the, um, one of the reactions that I had from some of my students uh, when I engaged them in self-assessment or giving formative feedback to their peers is that we're not experts enough to actually give because we don't know. So how can we, so how do we react to this? Yeah, and I agree. Um, but how do you actually develop expertise? By doing. Uh, you know, it comes back to the experiential learning part of problem-based learning. So how, how, how do you become uh, assessors, uh, good assessors? By developing the materials and then continuing to develop the skill of assessment, i.e. Uh, giving opportunities to individuals to actually uh, informally first and then more and more formality as you go through the processes of uh, producing that critical um, uh, materials. And, and you need to value it. So if you take a look at what actually happens at the end of my courses, even at the undergrad level, uh, the majority, so about 30 to 40 percent of the actual assessment or the grades, if you want to use that kind of terminology, is coming from the students through either self-assessment or peer assessment. I have no real issues with that. I mean, generally speaking, if you take a look at the reactions of the students, students who are very much invested in the processes and are learning the, the skills um, that they need to employ, et cetera, are, are the ones who are actually tough on themselves, probably tougher than I would be. Whereas the ones who are not particularly engaged, those are the ones who are, yeah, they, they have a tendency to give themselves Full, full grades or uh, very, very little critical feedback. Um, they'll, they'll say things like, uh, good job, and uh, uh, I really like how you did this or something along those lines. But those are not actionable. You can't do anything with that. A at which point, uh, I, I have no, um, I, I do not actually degrade their, their contributions or anything. If, if anything, uh, I think it's really important that we continue to value uh, all contributions, even if they are inappropriate. Uh, after all, how did we become assessors? And again, I, I would go back to this whole idea that it's the conception of the task that actually counts. So students, in using the terminology that you were using, we don't know if we're doing it correctly. Well, hold on. That means that there is a correct way and that there is an incorrect way. Uh, I, I don't deal with dualism very well. Um, it, the, the world is much too complex for dualism. It's more like, and I have to work, uh, deal, deal with this kind of thing. It's, it's more like shades of, I don't know. Gray. I, I can't use gray anymore. <laughs> um, pink, whatever. Um, so it's, 
well, Shades of Grey actually probably came from black and white photography anyways, but, uh, uh, and we don't have that anymore for the most part. Um, so it's, it's this whole idea that, that the world is way too complex to be able to deal with du dualities. Um, so let's get in there and let's start working on developing our, our, um, our competence uh, over time. And, and yeah, we're not really good uh, to begin with, but the, the best thing that we can actually do is uh, do it over and over and over again so that we actually start developing those particular competencies. Um, the, the other piece that comes along with this is that uh, we have been developing for the last, oh, uh, 2001 was the first uh, um, publication that I know of uh, about this kind of uh, material, but we've been putting together what we call um, readiness kinds of assessments. And uh, our readiness assessments are essentially surveys that uh, take a look at uh, various aspects of our practice as online uh, learners. And, and I see myself as an online learner, as well as the, the students who are working with me. Um, what we try to do in, in our model, anyways, is to de decrease the amount of differential between myself and the students by saying, if I'm a learner and you're a learner and we have similar responsibilities to each other, does it really matter that we're learning and you should therefore not look at me as being an expert in your particular problem areas because I don't know them any better than you know yours. Uh, it's, it's this kind of piece. So we're, we're working on decreasing what is called transactional distance. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Michael Moore's conception in 1997 of a psychological differential between individuals in the communication process, uh, particularly between instructors and uh, students. Um, and so what we try to do is create horizontal kinds of communities. Uh, those horizontal communities give us the opportunity to actually have conversations where we all become learners of the materials. And I've lost track of what the question was that you gave to me. Yeah, it's okay, but this is very interesting what you're, 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 you're talking about, um, the horizontal piece, because this is what, and again, because of my training uh, in, in problem-based learning that I had with you is that this is the first thing that I say to my students I'm part of your group right yeah. like I, this is where and we're learning together and we're co-constructing knowledge together there and there are so many things that I will be I've, I will be learning from you and from whatever you're bringing to the group so really having and and they are always surprised by that because they don't expect this and they're like hmm in some cases they actually question my expertise of being there yep. you know yep. so they feel as if i don't know or and then with time with the, going through the you know different classes and really understanding the approach that i'm taking then they understand the fact that i'm there actually to facilitate the learning and it's yep. actually I'm, and i'm giving them the space to actually control how they are learning and control what they're bringing to the table and what you know so the whole but it takes some time yep. for them to get used to this new approach because they're not you know they're not trained that way yep. they're not yep. taught that way before so this horizontal uh, approach is it's very very interesting uh, i'm looking at time and there are so many things that i want to talk so before we run off of time um i uh, i would really like you to share uh what is the digital competency profiler Okay. And what is your fully online learning community uh, survey? Uh, no, uh, the, 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 the model, the fully online learning community model. Community model, yeah. yeah. Um, um, so I'll, I'll start with the uh, fully online learning community model. Uh, essentially, it's derivative. Uh, originally, it was a derivative of the community of inquiry model that comes out of Athabasca University, uh, Anderson, Garrison, and Archer. Um, in that order? No, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. Anyways, uh, the, the idea, though, is that um, you, you have a number of overlapping uh, spheres or um, uh, ovals, if you want. Uh, one of those being social presence. That is, how do you present yourself in the online space as a human being? Um, so that's not only the communication kinds of aspects, but it's all the ethical issues. Uh, how do we value each other? How do we ensure that the other uh, feels valued? Um, 
and is treated in an ethical kind of way. And then finally, the social presence also deals with issues of security. So how, how do I know that you are going to um, respect my personage, uh, my, uh, the, the things that I'm going to say and that you're not going to spread them uh, around? Uh, in other words, how do I uh, trust, how do I come to trust you? And, and how do I start to um, experience this whole idea, idea that I can risk myself as I'm looking at a particular problem and trying to come up with solutions that are going to be appropriate. So that's all part of social presence, uh, presenting yourself as a human being to each other so that we can interact. Um, cognitive presence is another one of these overlapping spheres. Um, and cognitive presence is the ability to present yourself as an individual who's thinking. Um, not only having thought processes that are, are, are well established, but also having the ability to um, uh, change those thought processes, be malleable in terms of those kinds of thought processes, et cetera, um, <clears throat> and, and being able to actually uh, create new understandings as you're going along. So this is where the social constructivism kind of piece comes into uh, the, this whole uh, mix. The, the interesting piece is that social presence is required so that you can interact with others to be able to uh, start addressing the cognitive pieces. That's why these spheres are overlapping. And how do we actually get to, to the present where we're actually doing that? We're doing that in a collaborative kind of way. So we come together as a small group of individuals who are going to be exploring a particular situation or context. We create our own problem. We talk about it with each other uh, and collaboratively try to come up with solutions. And I'm using the terminology collaboratively from the perspective that uh, as compared to cooperative, cooperative talks about being able to actually take the problem, break it up into component parts, assign those component parts to individuals, and then pull it all together at the end. Now in collaboration, it's not that breaking up into component parts, it's that we are all going to be addressing these together so that at the end of the day, we can all own not only the problem, but the set of solutions that we're actually coming up with. We all know what's involved because we negotiated them with each other. Uh, so that's that collaborative learning piece. And it happens to occur within a context of a digital learning space. So the digital learning space gives us essentially the context, but it also gives us tools to be able to work with. And what we're actually seeing in the digital space is that it becomes co-created. So that uh, some of the tools are actually going to be made available through the, the structure of the course to begin with. So in other words, the course facilitator is making some choices about the kinds of tools that are available. So for instance, I could throw in Slack for a communication tool. I'll throw in Knowledge Forum as a reflection tool. Uh, I'll throw in uh, Google, Google Drive as a mechanism for transfer of files and creation materials, et cetera. Um, but the students are actually going to be bringing in a set of tools for themselves as well. So things that they're familiar with, things that they can use to address the particular aspects of the problem. So one of the first things that they do is probably pull in WhatsApp or something along those lines so that they can communicate with each other outside of class time, whatever that is. Um, class is, uh, is a construct that uh, I'm not particularly familiar with anymore. Um, and uh, they can also bring in a whole set of other tools. So um, Trello bringing in uh, Padlet, bringing in, you, you name it, uh, to do a number of different kinds of, of uh, tasks uh, in, in front of them. Um, so this is the conception uh, that we have. There's a number of underlying um, pieces or theories that are, are part of the FOLC model as, as well. And if uh, people are looking for more information, there's lots and lots of information on the EI Lab website, um, but there's also uh, copious numbers of papers that uh, uh, we've released uh, through the ResearchGate profile. Uh, and so they can access uh, either of those, uh, and you know where those are. Um, going back to the DCP and the FOLCS. So lately what we've been doing is putting together uh, sets of tools, and this is where I was going earlier before I lost train of my, my question. Um, 
sets of tools that actually give people the opportunity to see, uh, take a snapshot of where they are in terms of their skill development, uh, in terms of digital competence and usage. So that's the DCP, the Digital Competency Profiler. Um, and it gives you a series of, uh, after you finish the, uh, the 29 questions that are part of the profiler, it gives you a series of uh, visualizations that allow you to analyze uh, the, the, uh, the, the skills and competences that you actually have and compare them to the others within the cohort that you uh, were working. Um, it also gives you an interpretation and it gives you a set of suggestions as to uh, what those what you could do to actually increase your competence and and so you get this idea that it's a snapshot it's giving you a, an idea of what your skills are today and then if you do it next week or next month you can take another snapshot and you can actually start to compare those because we give you the opportunity to to take a look at those snapshots through what we're calling the Global Readiness Explorer, and it's customizable, so it's called the GREX, uh, Global Readiness Explorer. And what it does is essentially you, you log in with, your, with an email address. Uh, the email address that you're using is up to you, um, whichever one you want. Uh, we don't get access to it, so it, it can be whatever you want. Um, and uh, you can then take a look at iterations of your skills uh, as you're going through. We also have a fully online learning community survey, which has the same kind of structure as the DCP. Uh, it's a set of 29 questions, and it gives you access to how uh, well do you actually understand or how, how well have you moved into a fully online learning community type environment. And again, it's a snapshot of the kinds of skills and competences that you have. And then the idea is that you can develop those over time. Um, we, we talk about both of these together, so the DCP and the FOLCS as being an online readiness tool or measure. Um, and uh, you can use it for career purposes, career planning purposes. You can use it for a, an assessment for yourself to um, be able to actually access uh, online kinds of pieces, but it's also uh, sort of a, a learning tool in and of itself. I, I'm a great believer in learning um, uh, for, uh, sorry, assessment for learning. So as you're going through the process, uh, what you're actually doing is being exposed to other conceptions of what you can do in an online educational space and try to figure out, so what does this have to do with my understanding of what education is all about. So it's uh, opening doors. On the institutional side, so when we look at the um, uh, accumulated uh, data from a large group of individuals, um, what we can actually do is start to make decisions about what are the, the uh, corporate needs of the students and therefore start to address them in terms of the kinds of curriculum that we would actually uh, put together, the kinds of pedagogical structures that we would want to put in place and make decisions about kind of professional learning would have to be available for staff and faculty so that they could actually start addressing the creation of the pedagogy in the curriculum. So it's a fairly comprehensive kind of package. Um, the, the, the GREX, the DCP and the FOLCS is available uh, free of charge, it's open source. Uh, what we do, uh, however, is ask that individuals and groups that actually want to make use of them uh, get in contact and we will co-analyze uh, the data that's actually derived. Uh, so we'll actually give you uh, access to the expertise that we have developed in terms of taking a look at the, uh, uh, the results. And uh, we've got uh, right now uh, a fairly large number of um, uh, of partners who are doing those kinds of pieces. Uh, you'll see it on the GREX dashboard itself, uh, and they range from um, schools here in uh, North America and Canada, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in Ireland, and in Germany, Austria, uh, and we're adding new partners as we go along. Great, so thank you so much for your time.